Hi, how has your day been? Uh, welcome to my channel. I hope you've had a good day. I wanted to come home and do this impromptu video. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm uh, delaying my haircut, and I, I, I don't look all that well kept. I guess I could look better. Trust me. But I wanted to talk about this video that I'm labeling um, "Surpassing Trauma." Usually you'd call it something like overcoming trauma, but um, I wanted to call it surpassing instead of overcoming because overcoming sounds like, and I'm trying not to look directly at my face preview right now, I'll, I'll uh, look, I guess, at the camera light. Uh, I wanted to name it surpassing instead of overcoming because overcoming implies that you're you're still dealing with it or you you haven't gone beyond it and I've talked about this certain thing I would call it personally I would deem it a trauma uh, for myself um, that I've been trying to work you know uh, get over for quite a while uh, and what what prompted it was today was what prompted this video actually was uh, messaging somebody earlier and um, I got some help and some confirmation uh, reassurance and I feel better and um, I figured that although you know it's personal to me I can talk about this in generalities because if, because I imagine many of you 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 yourself may have been going through this um, it doesn't matter how the, the size of the trauma it I don't think it, it really matters whether what other people whether other people deem it as a trauma or not. Um, it's the effect I think on you. So let me say that that that's been a spoiler war enough of a spoiler warning. Uh, I'll talk in generalities. I don't want to give anything away in terms of details. Um, I just want to say that it's been something that I've been dealing with for a long time. Um, a, a few people that I've, I've talked to about it have said uh, that they hope, you know, that, that they wish that I could move beyond it, uh, you know, put it behind me. And I recognize the importance of it, but uh, instinctively I felt that it had to be resolved because I can bury it, I can bottle it up for a while, but there's only so long that you can bottle up something like this. Um, and it needs to be dealt with. I'm somebody that very much believes that some that these things need to be dealt with, not just traumas, but just unresolved things and uh, lingering things, lingering problems, lingering issues. Uh, so the, at the start of it, you know, at the start of this whole thing, uh, a few years, well, quite a few years ago, um, I was trying to understand what was going on and I was trying to seek answers and that just exacerbated it. And I, I guess made it, um, made it worse. Um, it seems every time I tried to do that, it would make it worse. So why did I keep doing it? I mean, why did I keep pursuing some kind of resolution or answers or, or some kind of understanding? Um, well, again, it's it's because these um, these memories of what happened and uh, things people said and and texted would go around in my head, um, and I've gotten better. I mean, in the first few years. Um, it was much worse to uh, handle that um, because I felt it was my entirely my fault at the beginning of it. I felt as though you know I was a monster. I was I did something horrible, and and um, you know I all I did was um, try to be kind. I won't go into specifics, um, but. You know, I, I I have some feeling of conscience, and I wanted to 
uh, make things better. And um, in retrospect now, I mean, be, based on what I know, and, and some people have reassured me, it wasn't all my fault. And I didn't know exactly what was going on. But it still doesn't stop these um, memories and uh, these uh, things people said and so forth um, from lingering around and lingering around and, and they get bottled up. And uh, there's a song, there's a song by Yes in the 1980s called Owner of a Lonely Heart. I don't want to put it up for risk of having this whole video taken down for copyright reasons. <sighs> you know, I mean, with YouTube, you never know. So I figured I'd just play it safe, but maybe I'll put a link in at the bottom. Uh, look up the Yes song from the 1980s called Owner of a Lonely Heart. There's a part in there that I, I interpreted um, a certain way. He, uh, it, shows, it, it, it shows somebody walking into a courtroom and uh, there's a judge or somebody passing judgment on him. And I interpreted that as, uh, as him passing judgment on himself. And, um, and there's also a line, well, there's all a line there. Um, it's, is it, uh, I'll be vague about it here. Um, um, owner of a broken heart. Um, is that better than owner of a lonely heart implying, uh, owner of a lonely heart, you haven't, um, you haven't taken any action. If you do take action, there's a risk that you could get a broken heart from it. So it's a question, should you try or should you remain lonely? And, and then you're still, um, you're still in some sense in pain. Um, I thought about, uh, I thought about two figures in our public consciousness. Uh, I thought about Anakin becoming Darth Vader, and I thought about um, in the Star Wars legacy, and I thought about Richard Nixon's uh, farewell address, so to speak, his resignation address. Um, I also thought about, uh, in addition to, you know, these... Uh, Thing, thoughts lingering, uh, the the framework or the the, the scheme, the, the concept that Dr. Richard Schwartz had developed called internal family systems. That is that uh, we, he that we each have certain parts of our mind that deal with certain aspects. And uh, there's uh, something essentially uh, split personality or, or um, uh, dissociative identity disorder, which could simply be explained in terms of this framework as uh, internal family members of your mind not working together well in harmony. Um, the jury is still out, in my opinion, as to whether that actually exists, that uh, dissociative identity disorder. It's intriguing. It, If true, it sheds light on how our minds work. And that's, in some sense, what this channel is all about, introspection with Jeff. Uh, he identified, well, all right. He worked with, he was a psychologist, I believe. He, he dealt in mental health. And he would be seeing family members and dynamics between family members and certain family members taking on certain roles sort of automatically in these dynamics and there's an interplay and the dynamics work in certain ways. Then he noticed in his other patients that they, the patient would sometimes say, well, part of my mind is thinking this, another part of my mind is thinking that, and part of my mind is hurt by this and so forth. And so he worked out this concept of internal family systems. He identified, okay, first he identified like a part of the mind that's the, uh, I would, what I would call the mediator. I forget exactly what he called it, but he would manage these other parts. And uh, there could be a part that would um, 
experience trauma and hold on to the memory of a trauma. And uh, there would be another part that's acting like a firefighter that puts out quick fires. Uh, by, by fire, I mean that, that traumatic moment. Um, this isn't the long-term thing. I mean, these firefighters aren't acting in the interests of long-term repercussions. They're simply out there uh, putting out the fires, the immediate fires um, caused by actions of the body or the rest of the mind. So, for example, uh, let's take um, alcoholism. Uh, there could be an underlying reason why somebody turned to alcohol and became addicted to alcoholism. Um, it could be an underlying event or something, uh, but the part of the mind would be this firefighter that's causing the person to drink to put out the fire, put out the fire. Um, however, it nulls the pain of the memory still held by that, that part, that one of those parts that's still retaining that memory. And he noticed that when he was able to talk with the patient, and I don't know whether he used hypnosis or not, but when he would just try and communicate with that part that held the memory, the part, this, this is the key thing, this is in some sense why I bring it up now, why it seems relevant for this video, uh, the part, the, the person would say, speaking on behalf of this part, or you know, the part speaking through this person, uh, still seems to be locked in that time period when the event occurred. Um, pick some traumatic event, uh, like for example, the person may have been seven years old. Uh, the part still seemed to regard the person as seven years old or regard itself as being seven years old, even though the, the person may be uh, 42. And uh, the, the firefighter part has been doing a good job or an adequate job in maintaining the person going through life into his early 40s uh, and putting out these fires by, for example, uh, causing alcoholism, you know, inducing the, the body to drink alcohol or do some other thing to uh, null the pain and, and get through the moment. Um, but the memory hasn't gone away, and he noticed that when he talks directly to the part, he uh, the part then, um, I'm not sure if the part necessarily needs, feels a need for the firefighter anymore, but the part, there's like a dialogue between Dr. Schwartz and the part, the part begins understanding and, and dealing, working through that seven-year-old, that event from w when, that event at age seven, and uh, becomes, I guess, a, a adapted to the fact that it's now, uh, that the body is now age 42, and there's so many, uh, um, and there's 30-something there's years that have passed since then. Um, and so the, the mediator part like manages, I think it's called a manager, I think he called it a manager, manages all these parts, tries to, and in, in not necessarily in a, a great, outstanding, healthy way, but at least tries to hold everything together. He also noticed that when there are certain traits, there's certain feelings within the person, uh, they tend to start with the letter C, creativity, uh, conscience, uh, compassion, communication, so forth, uh, uh, calmness, um, that those don't seem to hold on to traumas. Uh, they, the, uh, I remember he mentioned this in an interview, he, or a lecture, he, he would hear some of these calm, the, the person talking about these calm parts of themselves or, or creative parts of themselves, courageous parts of themselves. And he would ask, well, what part is that? And uh, the, the person, the whole person would say, well, that, 
doesn't seem like a part. It seems like my true self, my true self. And so uh, when I heard that, I was reminded nicely of the Force in Star Wars. Um, there are so many uh, references to the Force and uh, how it works, but basically if, if you go through the original trilogy, I haven't really... I've watched the prequel trilogy, but I haven't really studied it. I, I'm very familiar with the original trilogy. It seems to be how how that is that uh, that this concept that George Lucas made up. Um, if you play with it a little bit here uh, in the Star Wars universe, um, that the Force represents this confident self and you can do amazing things you're sure of yourself you you can uh, like there's a part where uh, a trainer tells Luke in the second movie well actually Luke asks how will I know the the good side from the bad or the the dark side how will I know the the light side from the the dark side and then the trainer says you will know when you're calm and at peace and and I interpreted that to mean uh, when you don't have distractions of these other parts arguing or whatever. If you're calm and you simply listen and uh, and pick up on intuition and pick pick up on certain instincts, um, you can think things through. And I wish more people would do that. Uh, there is a talk. Uh, there's a uh, there's a, a suggestion advocated by. A number of like mental health groups that we all need some peace and quiet to ourselves and uh, growing up I certainly had that I would um, I had my bed I would have my calm place and I would read and uh, and watch TV and, and so forth and that was time to myself I wasn't I was very active but I wasn't kept busy and I I wonder if too many people are kept busy. I don't know why. It seems so obvious to me to do this, but um, maybe too many people are kept active and, and too busy that they don't listen to themselves. They don't have quiet time to themselves. Um, that's basically what I, I wanted to say, other than the, I wanted to point out these two figures, uh, Darth Vader, well, Anakin Skywalker turning into Darth Vader and... Um, Richard Nixon's resignation address. Um, I'll start with Anakin. Um, if you, well, it's kind of spoiler alert already, we're into spoiler territory anyway. Um, when you meet him in the original trilogy, um, he's Darth Vader, and uh, he, he, it's amazing. I mean, it's very dramatic how he, he chokes people on a whim. He throws people around like they're rag dolls in front when he's frustrated. He throws people around and he, uh, it's very externalized. And he's, I guess, learned to use fear to his advantage. He works on fear. He, uh, he knows other people fear him and that's his power. And, um, and there's a moment, real spoiler, uh, in uh, in the third movie, meaning Episode Six, Return of the Jedi. Luke Skywalker is confident, who's his son, is confident that there still is Anakin in there somewhere. That Darth Vader, that he hasn't fully become mechanized. And um, at the end, he take he's watching. The Emperor killing off his son, you know, electric, literally electrocuting his son. And at some point he looks between the two. This is before George Lucas came out with the special editions where they inserted no into, into the shot. But originally you didn't need the no. You, you just saw Darth Vader masked uh, looking back and forth between the Emperor and his son being electrocuted. And at some point, he, he turns around and he just grabs the Emperor and throws him down, essentially down the pit. And uh, whenever I see that, I think to myself, um, 
without even having to watch the prequel movies, I I imagine him saying in so many words, uh, "You you f and whatever fill in the the curse the swear word, uh, you screwed up my life," and he throws the emperor down the pit. Um, and uh, he's come back to the light side, and Luke Skywalker was co correct in his suspicion, intuition, and he's Luke Skywalker was very much a hero in turning him around. And uh, anyway, so my point in bringing that up is that there is a danger in him um, letting his fear and anger get the better of him, and he becomes an agent of evil. I mean, it's said so in uh, Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back. He um, becomes an agent of evil. He doesn't really have a sense of independence. There's some sense that he's a slave to the Emperor. And I remember, as long as I, I'm mentioning this, I, I, met, I remember in the end, in the climax of The Empire Strikes Back, he says... Uh, you know, Luke, my son, um, with our combined powers, we can overthrow the emperor, implying that he's wanted to, for whatever reason, I think I know what the reason was, um, he wanted to, he wanted to get rid of the emperor, I think because the emperor had, um, had a stronghold over him and kept him as a master servant relationship um and he never broke free from that until until at the end of the third movie episode 6 Luke Skywalker got to him indirectly but got to him and he was finally able to uh have a sense of independent thought and an uh, independent sense of self to grab the emperor and throw him down the pit um, I also want to mention that, uh, speech by Richard Nixon, um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not of that same political stripe, but I thought it was very poignant what he said at the end. I don't remember the speech exactly. You can look it up, but he said, uh, something like if you, um, uh, beware of, um, beware of anger along the similar lines. I can't remember exactly how he put it, but beware of anger and, and fear and, and negative emotions um, because in the end they will destroy you. And of course he was involved in Watergate and obsessive, my opinion, obsessive behavior about Watergate and these sorts of things. And, and he had these triggers that probably induced this obsessive behavior and they can you know, in the end, they can be beware. Don't let them dominate you. Um, they can uh, they can destroy you. And you know, saying that, I'm also even reminded of a, a, a little bit of a story and a line in uh, in Genesis, the biblical book of Genesis, near the beginning. Um, Cain has killed Abel uh, out of jealousy or envy. Um, and there hadn't been any death before that. Um, I don't think you could actually call it murder because, uh, there's intent to kill the, you know, there's intent to render the other person dead. Um, there is no indication, quite the contrary. There's no indication because nobody had died yet. Um, but he was taking out his, his anger on his brother. And, uh, so, um, the Jewish deity that goes by the four letters, the Tetragrammaton, uh, it's translated into English. It's transliterated as YHVH, but usually in English dictionary, English translations, uh, you would see it as the Lord, which is a off-putting, incorrect um, use of it. Um, doesn't necessarily mean the Lord. There's a, it's a, you know, there's probably a whole history why they picked the Lord to insert there. But anyway. Um, Yudhe Vavhe says to him, um, uh, sin crouches in the corner, but you can be master over it. And that's a very nice thought to keep in mind 
that you can be master over this destructive intent, this destructive urge within you. Um, it can crouch in, it's a crouching in the corner, uh, but you're not in that corner yourself. You're, you're outside of that and you can be master over it. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, and I'll go on to happier things, uh, in some other video, but thank you for watching this. Thank you for, you know, taking the time. If you've gotten this far, thank you for watching it all the way through and I'll see you next time again. Hope you have a good day and, and wherever you are and happy, uh, upcoming weekend. It's, it's Thursday now, but I thought I'd say it early. All right. Bye.